Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. We hope you're encouraged by the message. For more in-depth content and answers to questions submitted during the sermon, check out our podcast called Postscript. You can find it on iTunes or on our website at faithbridge.org forward slash podcast. A reading from the Gospel of Luke chapter 2. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. So Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby, who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Glad that you are here on this Christmas Eve service, whether you're in this room, whether you're in Center Court West, whether you're in the loft, welcome, Merry Christmas, thanks for being here at Faith Bridge. Now I want to get something out here kind of on the table in the open as we get going along here. I'm aware of something and I want you to know that I'm aware of this something. And that is, I'm aware that a number of you, by the end of the day, several thousand people will come here and to many other churches all around the world. <clears throat> and it's not really because you wanted to come. It's because your spouse or your parents or your children or your neighbor or your relatives or somebody said, you're coming. And so here you are. Now, I just want you to know that I'm kind of aware that this dynamic, you know, goes on on special occasions, Christmas, Easter, this kind of thing. And I just kind of want to put you at ease and let you know you don't need to feel awkward about it because the truth of the matter is there's, there's a lot of people who are in the same boat with you. All right. So you're, you're in, in good shape and we'll get out of here pretty soon and we can get onto the food and to the parties and, you know, the gifts and all that kind of stuff. All right. I'm also aware of one other thing. And and I just want to sort of say this before we get going along. And that is that probably a number of people here today, you say, well, I'm here at this service. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, uh, not only am I here because somebody brought me and I didn't really want to come. I feel a little bit out of place here because I'm not really a church person. Okay, I've had several people over the years who've told me this, found it very interesting when they're just, I just appreciate their transparency, who said, you know, I, I, even when I came that first time on a Christmas or an Easter or whatever it was, I really felt kind of awkward and 
I was sort of sitting there thinking, gosh, I hope that, you know, my friend Joe or Mary or somebody in here and sees me here because I don't want them to think I'm being a hypocrite because I'm not really a church person. They know I'm not really a church person. And I was, I was thinking about uh, that as I was coming towards the story that I want us to look at today because I want us to look particularly at the shepherds in this story that we just heard read. Now, I'll tell you, shepherds were many things, but one of the things that shepherds were not was church people. They never went. They couldn't, even if they wanted to, they weren't allowed to go into the temple because you see, in those days, the laws of Judaism made very clear that you had to be clean and pure and you couldn't go in if you were contaminated or dirty or impure or you know, defiled or any of these sorts of things. Shepherds were considered all of those things. Here's the reason why. In the laws of Judaism, you couldn't handle dead things and remain pure. What did shepherds have to deal with all the time? They were always dealing with dead things. They were dealing with dead sheep and dead wolves and foxes and birds and all this sort of stuff. So they never got to go to the temple. Their job was just to raise up the sheep, to raise healthy, good sheep who would get into the hands of the good people who would take them off to the temple and offer them as sacrifices sacrifices to God so that they could feel closer to God. Okay, and I'm sure if, if you were a shepherd, it could have been kind of easy to get a little cynical if you were a shepherd. So you're like, we're just the help out here growing the sheep so that you people can take them off to church. And yet we know you people, we know what you're like. And uh, I'm sure it could be, uh, you know, a, a source of some cynicism in the hearts of shepherds. It's in that setting, in that mindset you see, that this angel bursts through the barrier between heaven and earth and says to the shepherds, says to the shepherds, I bring you good news that will cause great joy. A savior has been born to you, the angel saying, you shepherds. He's the Messiah, the Lord. Now, Don't you know, in addition to being freaked out, which the shepherds were, the Bible says, they would have probably been thinking as well, uh, you know, of angel. um, Angel, I hate to tell you, but I think maybe you got knocked off course a few, you know, when you were coming through the stratosphere because the temple's about six or eight miles over there. I don't think you mean to be bringing this message to us. (laughs) We're shepherds. We're not church people. I think you meant to pop in over there and tell them what you're telling us. Because, you know, we're not really qualified to, you know, or eligible to have a savior. We're not the church people. If that's what they were thinking, I think it's safe to say that their mindset would have been very uh, similar to the mindset of a lot of people in this church today and in countless churches all around the world where some one billion people in more than 2,000 languages will be worshiping today on Christmas. See, I know a lot of people who are here in all those churches are thinking to themselves, I'm not really a church person, so I'm a little bit of an outsider when it comes to, to this whole Christmas. I mean, I think it's a nice story and the manger and the sheep and the shepherds and the cattle are lowing and all that kind of stuff. I think it's nice and, you know, we go through that every year, but I don't think that really applies to me. I think a lot of people actually sort of feel that way. I don't know that I really qualify for a savior. I don't even know if really I need a savior. I mean, I mean I'm doing my best. I try to make sure that my good things outweigh my bad things. And, you know, I'm just trusting that everything kind of shakes out okay in the end when the scales of, you know, justice are balanced. I, I, you know, I think it'll be okay. At least that's kind of what I'm crossing my fingers. Now, but I'll tell you somebody who needs a savior, you'll say. That, that guy up in New York who killed two cops. You done, had anybody, what's the deal going on? Don't people realize the cops are the good guys? You don't kill the cops. That guy needs a savior. Or even lately, some people have been talking about Bill Cosby and all these accusations coming out about the guy. And and if, if, if even half of them are true, then one of America's favorite family friendly comics 
maybe was never quite the man that he would have had us to believe he was. You think to yourself, I never put drugs in anybody's drink. I mean, if that's, you know, I'm, I'm up here. I think I'm good. I think I'm okay. I don't think I really need a savior. I mean, the cop killer's down here and you got Cosby doing that kind of, yeah. yeah I, think, I think I'm good. Well, before you get too smug, before you declare your innocence, let me just ask you a question. Are you really the person that you would have us to believe you are? I mean, when other people aren't looking in the dark, in the quiet moments. Have you never had a lustful thought or urge or action? You're telling me you, you've never done anything dishonest or deceptive or manipulative or selfish or hurtful or proud or rude or arrogant or condescending? You're telling me you haven't done? Of course you have. So have I. All of us have done those sorts of things. So see, the point is all of us have sinned. The Bible makes it clear all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. You can't live in this world and not realize this world in which we live is dripping with sin. Murders, rapes, wars, human trafficking, drugs, diseases, violence, and on and on and on it goes. And so you may personally say, well, I'm not personally into sin, at least not up to my neck. But I'll tell you something, you're in it at least up to your ankles or your knees. You can't go through life and not be. The Bible says clearly all of us have been marked by sin. Even if you've always stayed clear of drugs and violence and warfare and, and all. And the Bible says this is a problem. It's a problem because God is perfect. We are not. We've all been marked with this sin and he's perfect and sinless. So how do we reconnect with him? Sin separates us from God. And so see, this is the very reason that God in his graciousness and his love, seeing us all marked by sin, said, I'm gonna send you a savior. It's the best gift you could ever have because he's gonna do for you what you could never do for yourself. Pastor Joel Baker tells the story, shares the story of, of how his mother immigrated to this country more than 100 years ago. She lived in Austro-Serbia and she lived on a farm and there she was abused and beaten by her father. It was a wicked man. And one day he said to her, go and sell some of the family cattle and bring the money home. So he went, she went and sold the cattle, and, but she didn't bring the money home. She went straight to the port, got on a boat and set sail for this country for America. And when she got here, she lands at Ellis Island. They get everybody off the boat and they line them all up in two parallel lines. And the immigration office officials started going down the line, checking for people's documentation, their passport, all that kind of stuff to give them permission to come to the country. Well, instantly she realizes she has none of that. And she's wondering what's going to happen. And so, and so finally the officer gets up to her and she explains she doesn't really have any of that kind of stuff. And he takes her hand in his and marks her arm with a chalk X with this chalk piece that he was carrying, signifying this one needs to be deported, can't come in, send her back. And he kept going back deeper in the line behind her. She's now worried about what in the world, how's this gonna, what's gonna happen? And just about that point, she feels a hand reach out to her from the parallel line standing next to her. And it was a man, Theodore Daisy. And he took her hand in his hand. And he took, his, took her arm and began to rub the chalk mark off. And when they got to the front of the line, he said to the official, 
she's with me. And within several weeks, they'd fallen in love and were married and would later have a grandson who would become a well-known preacher in Oklahoma. But in that moment, when she was standing there marked with an X, no documentation, no contact, no family to receive her, no one to pull her in, she was hopeless. She needed a rescuer. She needed a savior and she knew it. And in that moment, she felt his hand reach out and take hers. In a very real way, friends, all of us have been marked with sin. We've all been marked with sin in our lives. And tries we made to cover it up, to, to pretend it's not there, to hide it, it's there. And it's not going away. And it's for that reason God says, this is why there is Christmas. This is why I sent a savior into the world who would be born that night in the manger. Who wouldn't just stay a baby, who wouldn't just stay in the manger, but who would grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and other people. And he would live the life of sinlessness and perfection that you and I could never live. And then at 33, he went to the cross and he died the death of consequence and suffering and punishment that you and I all deserve for our sin. But he stepped in in our stead. He stepped in our place as our substitute. He goes to the cross, dies for us. And then on the third day, he was raised to new life, resurrected, signifying to all who are connected to him through faith that you too will rise victoriously in the end to eternal life. If you're linked to me, Jesus says, through faith. And so I ask you, have you ever linked yourself to him? Have you ever let him reach out his hand and take your hand in his and wipe the X of sin and guilt and shame off of you? Have you ever let him be your savior? Not just other people's savior, but your savior. In just a few moments, we're going to light the candles. And we do it every year and churches do it all around the world. And, and <clears throat> you're going to notice something. I was thinking about this the other day. Um, the candle that you'll be given, and I'll explain how that's going to happen momentarily. The candle that you'll be given has really just about everything it needs to be a candle. It, it's, it's all there. You've got the, the, the wax that gives it the shape and form. You've got the wick that gives it the ability to, to burn and melt. You've got the drip guard so that we don't get your fingers, you know, with the wax. And, everything. and so it's, it's just got everything it needs to be a candle except one thing. It doesn't have the spark. And the candle can't generate the spark by itself. That's why in a moment you'll lean your candle over and you'll let somebody else's spark light yours. And then you'll do the same to the next person as we go along and sing Silent Night. But you know, I was, I was thinking to myself in a very real way, our lives are kind of like those candles. We have everything that we need to be a human being except one thing. We can't generate our own spark. Oh, now I, some of us are kind of extroverted and we're peppy people and happy and joyful. And, and, but, but there's something altogether different about being touched by the hand of the Savior. We can't generate that spark from the inside. No matter how many positive thinking books you read and seminars you go to and self-help you know, deals you, you go to, we can't generate our own spark. Now, without Christ, you can still have a very fine life. You could you know, have a good job, you make good money, you have a family, you take trips maybe, and, and you watch sports and play instruments and enjoy music. And all that. You can do all of that without Christ, but you'll never be what you were created to be if you don't humble yourself and let him touch you with that life-giving spark that only Christ, our Savior, 
can give to us. And so I ask you again, have you, have you let him touch your life before? Some of you right now, you're saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm Catholic, or I'm Jewish, or I'm Protestant, doesn't matter. Some of you are saying I'm Muslim or Methodist or Baptist or Buddhist. Doesn't matter. Presbyterian, pantheist, doesn't matter. Aggie, Longhorn, doesn't matter. <laughs> doesn't matter. See, Jesus, there's something about Jesus. This is all together sets at a different level than all those other things that divide us. That's why we're celebrating here, if you didn't realize we're celebrating that God in his graciousness sent us this savior to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. Lighting us so that we could have purpose in our lives and hope and promise and joy and fulfillment. The purpose that comes from following a savior. So in just a moment, I'm gonna invite you, asking you the question once more, have you trusted your life over to Jesus Christ? It's a simple message today, that's what I'm asking you. My greatest joy today would be to hear of hundreds of people who came and said, I never thought about it that way before, but I think something clicked and I think I got it today. I think maybe I finally understood this whole manger and the savior and the baby and then 33 years later, the cross and the resurrection on Easter and all of that. And so the question is, would you have him to be your savior? He won't force you. That's something you have to decide. I'm gonna humble myself. I'm gonna soften myself. I'm gonna receive him into my life. I invite you to do that right now. Do it right now. You say, how do I do it? Through prayer. You just talk to him and say, I want you to come into my life and be my savior. Let's do it right now. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to come on this Christmas Eve to hear the story once again, to consider how you popped in on those shepherds that never saw you coming, never even figured you would come and talk to them, never figured they'd have anything to do with you. And yet you came, you said through the angel, I have good news for you. A savior is born for you. It's true for all of us, Lord. Thank you that you sent that savior. In that regard, all of us are sort of like shepherds. In the same way that they went, that night and saw the savior and finally found what they'd been looking for all their lives and found their lives transformed and went away rejoicing. Lord, my prayer is that today would be a beginning point for many people in their faith journey as well. And that even in this hour, many people in their hearts and minds would say, I want you, Jesus. I'm choosing you, Jesus. I ask you, Jesus, to become my savior. Not just all those other people, not just the church people, not just those, but my savior. Why don't you just talk silently right now in prayer. You tell him what it is that you need to tell him right now.
Now, continuing in that spirit of prayer, would you look back here at me and let me tell you what it is that we're going to do next. We're going to come to the Lord's table. And just to remember what it is that we're celebrating, we're celebrating that that baby Jesus didn't stay the baby, but grew up to become the man who would go to the cross. And the night before he did, he took that bread with his disciples and he gave it new meaning. And he said, this is my body and it's broken for you. And I want you to take it and eat it. And as you do, you're going to remember why I came to this earth. And then he took the cup and we use grape juice here. And he said, this is the representation of my blood. And I want you to take this whenever you come together to remember my blood that was poured out for your sins. Not for my sins, he said, for your sins. And so in just a moment, the ushers are going to lead you and you'll come to one of the stations and you'll take a piece of the bread and then you can dip it into the grape juice and then you can uh, partake. And then if you want to have a few moments of prayer, you can always kneel on the steps in front and have some time in prayer. And then uh, make sure that you get one of the candles. They'll give you one of the candles on your way back to your seat. And my hope is that even as we light the candles, that there would be a lighting that's going on deep in the hearts of many, many people saying, yes, yes. Today's the day I want to start journeying with you, Jesus. If you need the the gluten-free elements, they're on the little stations on my far right and my far left, both sides of the room in every room. And so you can sort of make your way out of the line of where you're coming and get to those stations yourself. And then we'll come back and we'll get the candles lit and we'll sing Silent Night. Let me pray uh, once more for us. Now, Lord, won't you meet with us? Thank you for the the symbols that you've given to us that remind us of the truths that we've talked about today. This, This bread and this grape juice, nothing really extraordinary about it. It's ordinary bread, it's ordinary grape juice. And yet, somehow by the touch of your hand, There's a representation of something extraordinary, your body and blood was broken and shed for us. That's where the miracle is. Not in the bread and the cup, but in what you did for us. In the way that even taking these symbols, these tangible symbols can just help our minds to remember back to thousand years the white is that you came on that very first Christmas we celebrate. Won't you commune with us now? Won't you meet with us now as we come to your table? Thank you, God, for each person who is here. Won't you speak to us now in Jesus' name?